Thank you everyone for coming on Friday. And I'm here to defend passwords. So if you would like to throw things, that's okay. But if you're gonna throw cliff bars, please break them into little pieces. Um, I'm Mike Schwartz. I'm the founder of Glue. And I'm also the, the lead um, developer or the lead evangelist, I don't know what we call it, at the Janssen Project. So that's the project at the Linux Foundation where we've moved the Glue software to. I wanted to start out with a quick joke because this is, this is Friday and, and I know everyone's like getting ready to leave and I'm sort of guilty of this. You know, we have a sort of family like, um, you know, Netflix account and I had another joke prepared about, about pizza but I, I don't think I can pull it off. It, it's too cheesy, so. <laughs> so, you know, this is a triangle that I've been talking about for a long time and, and then this triangle says to me that if you're gonna make certain choices about an authentication technology, that there's always trade-offs. And so we could have really great um, usability and security, but somehow we have to pay the price in deployability. Like, like the, there never seems to be a perfect triangle where we can get great security and great usability um, with, without paying this deployability price. And Microsoft did some research years ago and they said, they looked at all the different authentication technologies and they said, and, and they concluded that, that despite other technologies being more secure or more usable, no technology was as deployable as passwords. And I've been quite excited to hear about the the pass keys idea, you know, I attended all, all the sessions and I'm a, a really an advocate of FIDO. I have a whole stack, what did I do with these things? Yeah, so I have bunches of, of these, you know, keys. Um, I think I've actually personally done more FIDO demos than any other person on the planet because every time I show the glue server, I always demo, demo FIDO. So I've probably done hundreds of, of FIDO demos. So I'm, I, I talked at RSA uh, about all the different types of two-factor authentication, and yet passwords are still out there. Um, pass keys are really interesting because somehow they seem to be cheating this triangle in that we're saying we can get better security and be better usability with the same deployability as, um, a as passwords. But in a way, maybe, this, there's a, maybe I need to make this a square and not a triangle in the future, because it seems like the compromise that we're getting is that we're, we can get this great security and usability, but we have to sort of perpetuate the hege hegemony, I can never say that word, hegemony of these tech giants, because they're the only ones who can make it work for us. Um, so it's interesting, but most of us are still stuck in this, in this triangle world. Um, so I like this diagram because um, I feel like this is what most of my customers feel. <laughs> like they see password lists out there and they're like, oh yeah, this would be great. Uh, but no, we, we can't do that. Um, and th this is some research that came out. Um, I'm forgetting where this was. Um, but it said 37% of, of um, sites are using um, two-factor authentication. So... I, I have a password file and it's still over a hundred, I do a WC on that, it's still over a hundred lines. So there, there's still um, um, tons of, of sites that are just not going to, to two-factor authentication. Um, and you know, for of these 37% that are using two-factor authentication, most of them are using crappy two-factor authentication. So they're sending me an email with a code. And I, I frankly wonder if that's actually better um, because a, a lot of attacks, the thing that got compromised in the first place was your email account. So the point of sending me an a, a email token, I, I wonder what the point of that is. And SMS is, uh, I just don't trust my mobile provider to protect my phone number. I feel like anybody who goes in with a $100 bill could probably get an agent to move over my number at the T-Mobile franchise. So I don't have a lot of faith in SMS. So if you take out the SMS and email OTP, then how many of these are using a real 
real, it's probably even lower. Um, so this, this was from Ubico. Um, this was an infographic that they get, gave. And um, so, um, so when I ask customers, are, are you planning to implement 2FA? The answer is almost always yes. Um, and then I say, are you planning to implement 2FA soon? Then the answer is almost always no. So everyone wants to go, but, um, but it, it, it's harder. And I think the, the challenge has been around deployability and customers you know, know how to use it um, and businesses know how to deploy it. Um, so 25% so of professionals have no plans to provide 2FA to customers. So at least they're being honest. Um, and 60% of respondents say that they believe usernames and passwords offer sufficient security. Um, and um, anyway, so it's just, the, the numbers, these are, numbers are supposed to support um, to the to, they're supposed to support YubiKey's position, but I'm not sure that they actually really, really do. Um, so the truth is we have three tricks to, um, to identify a person. So when you connect to a website, you're a, you're a stream of electrons. You're, we have to figure out what person does this stream of electrons actually match to? And, and, that's, and that's the fundamental challenge. And we have three tricks to solve that challenge. You know, trick number one is, is something you know, trick number two is something you have, and trick number three is something you are. So you've probably heard this a million times. Um, now, what sometimes people get mixed up is they think of two-factor, so to have two-factor authentication, you need one from two different columns. So sometimes what I think people get mixed up is that they might have two from the something you have column and call that two-factor um, authentication, but it, it's really not. Um, so one of the challenges around password managers and, and the design of passwords in general is that the password manager has changed the something you know trick into a something you have. And so we've basically fundamentally defeated the design of passwords. And now we're complaining that the passwords are broken. So if you, if you get nothing out of this conference other than this, read this book. <laughs> this is a great book. Um, it's sort of about how to be a, a, a VPE, a, you know, Vice President of Engineering, but it has a really great um, a, a number of really great pieces of advice. Um, and one of them is avoid the ground up rewrite. The ground up rewrite always takes more time and is more difficult than, than people anticipate. So if we're saying we're gonna go password, passwordless, I'm basically reading that as we wanna do a ground up rewrite on passwords. We wanna throw out passwords and we wanna start up and we wanna build something new. And our engineering advice is don't do that. Um, that, that that's going to be more difficult than you think. Um, but th this is a really great book. Um, so rather than, and, and the advice of, of the book is basically, instead of throwing out the thing that you would like you to, to rewrite, figure out how to incrementally improve it. And that will probably give you a better result than actually going with the ground up rewrite. So how do we incrementally fix passwords? Now, I, I'm not naive about this. You know, so if, um, if security tokens are over here, let's say USB security, and passwords are over here, we're never gonna get security tokens or passwords to be as secure as security tokens, but can we move them over a little bit and maybe make them over here? And, and, and will, would that actually mitigate some risks and, um, and at least help some of our customers who um, can't, um, can't actually migrate to, to these new fancy 2FA mechanisms. So, and I would actually break that into two pieces. So um, how can we ex improve the user experience of passwords and how can we improve the security of passwords? Okay, 
So, you know, this one, not everyone is going to agree with me on, but um, if I'm typing a document and I see a typo, I can fix it. Um, but if I see if a bunch of stars there and I make a typo, I'm not going to be able um, to notice it. So I feel like we're we're making this we're we're making the stars, but we're we're paternalistically implementing the security protection. Uh, why doesn't why don't we let the person decide if they actually need that protection rather than paternalistically saying we're going to make it all stars all the time by default. Um, when I'm at home in my home office, I'm not really worried about the side channel attack of somebody looking over my shoulder and stealing my password. So how many, what's the cost of productivity cost that this, um, that this policy of making the password stars has cost society? Um, why can't we just see the, the, see the darn thing? Um, this is really a math problem, but actually, your, if we make it longer, we actually get more entropy. So the, the reason we would have the complexity requirements is if we have a fixed number of characters, like in the old days you only had eight characters for your password, then yeah, making, adding in more characters is, gives you more entropy. But we're not generally limited anymore by, um, by length. So let's, let's use passphrases. And, and those passphrases can be easier to remember. And let's actually let people see them as they type them in. So NIST has recommended don't make people rotate their passwords, um, especially if you're doing mean um, complexity requirements. So, and, and this is really one of the main gists of my um, uh, recommendation for, for how do we improve the security. How you type your password is unique. Actually, every, every like, as you go into, or deeper, or look deeper, every single thing about a human is unique. Um, so like, um, I, we're seeing more biometric. I always said, why don't I hold up my phone to my ear? My, isn't my ear unique? It turns out somebody patented that. Um, I've, I think I've seen every type of biometric um, uh, patent. Um, the one that I'm waiting for is what I call smell authentication. Um, if I walk into a pitch black room, my dog knows it's me like 100%. Like he knows it's me like as if he were seeing me. That's how sure he is. So I'm, I'm waiting for the day when I can just put my phone under my arm. And, um, but, um, but I like keyboard dynamics. Um, there's a couple of words for this, typing velocity, keyboard dynamics. There's a couple more. Um, so this is looking at the, at, at the, the timings between um, how you type your password. And, um, so, and it really makes typing the password into a biometric um, um, factor. And um, so it, it becomes, the password can become two-factor because how you type it is something you are and how you, um, and the password is something you know. Now, it's only something you know if the password manager doesn't autofill it for you. So you have to disable autofill, which, will anno which might annoy users, which is why we want to make it clear text and, um, um, or let them see what they're typing and um, um, to improve the usability. Um, by the way, you can look at other things the user types. So we're not just going to look at the password. Let's look at how the user types the username, or maybe CAPTCHA, or anything else you can make them type um, is good. So how would, how, what is the attack um, surface area of, of passwords? Um, and so there's actually so many ways to attack passwords. This is only like a, a um, some of the ways, but um, one of the main ways is you can just buy passwords on the dark web. Um, you can have a key logger. Somehow you're getting the, the keys as the person types it. Um, people use dictionary passwords. You can guess the passwords. Um, phishing is probably the number one attack. Um, or well, no, actually, stolen credentials is number one. But but phishing is a really effect effective way. Um, you so you trick the user to going to 
a site that look, so the user thinks they're at the site that, they're, um, that they want to log into, but they're actually at the hacker site. And the hacker tricks them to enter their password, and then the hacker proxies to the real site. So you really look like, let's say you're going to your bank, it really looks like you're at your bank. You're seeing your balance, everything looks fine, um, but you're not, and, and the hacker now has your password. Um, social engineering, we heard a great keynote about that. Um, insecure networks, your Wi-Fi. There was once uh, this bus, it went from New York City to Boston for five bucks, and it had free Wi-Fi. Um, so I was like, great, it's a cheap ride, and they steal my, my password, so. Um, insecure recovery, um, what else? Memory leaks, so these are more esoteric that I wonder how often they happen. Um, so of these, if we were to use the behavioral biometrics, um, I believe that almost all of these would be mitigated um, because even if somebody were to buy my password on the, dark, on the dark web, they wouldn't type it in like I type it in. So the, the attacks that are not mitigated, the phishing man in the middle attack is not mitigated um, because if I'm typing my password in on the fake website, um, then potentially, um, they would, the, 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 the um, timings would be the same. And the side channel attack, actually nothing prevents a side channel attack. That's the wrench, you know, so. So the, the benefits of, of this would be um, no impact to like, no changing the culture and ritual of, of how passwords are used and um, one of the, the drawbacks is it probably doesn't work on your, on your, this is really, this keyboard dynamics I think only works for your laptop. It doesn't really work for mobile. But basically um, it can be implemented without, uh, without the user maybe even knowing that it's there. Um, on the mobile phone, um, maybe on the mobile phone you could actually, the mobile phone has a rich set of data so I think you could come up with other strategies on the mobile phone. Maybe you actually sign in, um, or, um, but I, I, think, I think this is possible. But um, so this is it. Um, give, give users a choice. So I'm not uh, saying that if a user um, has a, a pass key or a FIDO device, let them use it. I'm personally really annoyed that my bank won't let me use my YubiKey. Um, so if the user wants to do that, that's great, but let's try and help all of these, um, you know, hundreds of websites maybe that are still going to be using passwords because they don't feel it's worth it um, to actually implement better usability and better security. And one, one quick last joke. So we launched this service and I think it really gets the message across and we're calling it the password with a U. And the idea is putting the U back into passwords. <laughs> and that's it. And we have questions or any questions, thoughts? Sure. Can Thank you. Um, with the whole like digital like fingerprinting with like how they type their passwords and stuff, I don't see any reason that that wouldn't work on the phone if they're just typing it on the phone keyboard too. But um, wouldn't you have to keep like an unreasonable amount of data on people to like authenticate? Because like if they make a spelling mistake in their yeah. password and they put a backspace to and fix it, or if they're typing it on their phone versus their laptop versus their mm -hmm. tablet, they're going to type it differently. Wouldn't you have to keep a whole ton of data on the users just for their password. Right, so th there's a whole bunch of vendors who provide this um, service. Um, just to name a few, there's Pluralock, there's CallSign, there's a company called Typing DNA, and um, who am I missing? A Behaviosec. Um, so, so there's a lot of vendors out there and each vendor is gonna do it differently. And um, so, I, I think the answer is always yes. Like I think they could do it if they knew you were on your um, on your mobile. With every biometric, there's always an enrollment, and after a number of enrollments, and based upon the sensitivity, they can make a prediction as to whether that's you. So if they can get you to type your password in a couple of times in your mobile, which sounds kind of mean, then they could probably do that. Um, um, so. Um, 
Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind about these, so the one challenge of this that I don't really bring up is that how do you store that timing information without storing the actual password in the database? Um, so that's tricky and all the vendors are gonna have their own ways that they try and protect against um, their database being a big honeypot of like passwords, of clear text passwords. So there's gotta be some type of encryption in however the vendor implements this. So I think there, there, are, there are a bunch of concerns in like how, how it gets implemented for enrollment. Every biometric um, solution has challenges around enrollment and also privacy and security implications because this is sensitive data. Yeah. Ross? Not a question, but a comment. I wanted to make mention that the Office of Management and Budget and the federal government has mandated, and I'm gonna read it to get it right, the removal of the requirement for special characters and numbers in password policy. So it hadn't gotten into NIST yet, but that's the operational uh, mandate that each agency is doing. In addition to that, uh, rotation of passwords uh, for no good intended purpose is, is also, they don't want that to happen anymore either. So yeah, supports what you're saying here. Yeah, and I was influenced by, by the NIST and government guidelines. So I, I don't know that I would have had the confidence to make some of these recommendations if the US government hadn't actually like said it, so yeah. But you know, those, those recommendations, I think, don't always filter down to the, the, the security compliance checklist that you need for SOC 2 or for, they're gonna say, well, do you have these complexity requirements? Because checkbox number 42 says that it's necessary. So a big part of this, this battle is going to be actually um, on the regulation compliance side, talking through your CISO as to why we shouldn't comply with this thing that's on the checklist. And that's probably one of the biggest impediments. And Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No worries. <clears throat> Are you aware of any any companies, any any sites who implemented this pa password velocity as a second factor successfully? Have implemented successfully. So the question is, uh, have I, do I know of companies that have successfully implemented keyboard dynamics as, as a, a way to improve factor. security? Yep. Um, you know, no, I, I don't. Um, however, I know that these are offerings by a number of companies, and this strategy actually is not a new strategy. It's been around literally since the 80s. So it's an old, it's a really old idea, but I'm wondering why we tossed out this idea and why we, why we don't do it more. No, but, I, uh, I guess I'm, I understand from fraud prevention point of view, this could be one thing you can add to, to the things that you're doing. However, I'm not sure if you can enforce that as a second factor because then it becomes required, mm -hmm. right? So in my opinion, um, um, so the, the question is, if your behavioral biometrics comes back false, so this, I, I don't think this is the person typing the password, you also still need to, to do something. You could lock the account, you could send, go, ask for another um, um, factor, but um, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I don't understand your question. I guess the question I was trying to understand is that you can you can take note of this and and can you can use it to add to the risk score right but you cannot make it a required second factor for user to access your resource because there's a very good chance that as uh, the gentleman mentioned right somebody makes a mistake uh, and try to retype the password and and it, that that screws up the the authentication process now you you block the user or you may have to send him to some high level security, maybe I add security question answer or something else as, a, as another fact. Yeah. Right? So. Uh, yeah, I, you know, um, um, th there's, we're trying to improve, but I don't think that there's any perfect solution. So, um, so I, I think this is a way that, a strategy where we can make things a little bit better, but somebody, one, one, somebody I, I don't know who said, maybe it was one of these World War II generals said, don't let uh, perfection get in the way of a good plan. Was that Patton or somebody? But yeah, yeah, so I think it's a valid point, yeah. Um, Carlos? So uh, I'll make it quick. How do we see behavioral analytics when it comes to passwords 
handle the circumstance where I sprained my wrist and now all of a sudden I can't type my password the same way. Right. So, so if you fail the behavioral biometrics, you're going to have to fall back to, to something. And that depends on the company's policy, right? Um, but yeah, that, that's going to happen. I, I always wonder about that with, with all bi um, biometrics. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I see this, see a lot of behavioral biometrics are borderline fraud detection. Um, so they don't, it's not actually, this one's weird because I'm actually suggesting it is a second factor. It's a, it's a something you are. Um, a lot of um, behavioral biometrics are more indicators of this looks a little risky. Um, so, um, uh, but I, I don't think that there's an answer for that. The poor person who hurt their wrist is going to have to like pull out their phone or put, use their pass key or whatever. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about, you said switching from like a password to a passphrase and using like removing all the special character requirements. Yeah. Would you then put requirements on the length of the password, like a minimum requirement of like 25 yes. characters or something? Um, but would, would it also make sense to still have some special character requirements? Because I feel like a passphrase would be pretty vulnerable to dictionary attacks if it was just like the first sentence of a book uh -huh. or something. Um, I would say no. Um, actually, when you start combining words, um, now there might be certain, like the one that I gave, to be or not to be, that is the question. Um, we might have a same dictionary-like attack um, with certain passphrases. So I think that there's going to be some type of analysis during a re registration that you're going to need to do to say, no, this is a well-known passphrase, just like it might be a well a dictionary word. So, um, so yeah, we might need to develop some new techniques around well-known passphrases. But yeah, that's a good point. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're out of time for questions. Mike, thank you very much for your okay. talk today. Um, thank you all for the engagement. Um, Please go into the app, the Identiverse app, and fill out your session surveys for this session and every other one that you went to. Those really help us as the content committee to figure out what sessions you want to see for next year. Thanks all. Bye.